Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. It is that time again. Time for Wednesday night Bible study. Let me introduce ourselves to you. I am Pastor G. Rodney King, and I'm here with my lovely wife, Janet King. And we pray that everyone is doing well. You're staying safe you're, you're, and cool. <laughs> and you're practicing the protocol set in place by the CDC. Because we're still not out in the woods, people. There's a little slight surge going on with this virus. So it's still prevalent. All right. And there are still people that are still getting sick. We know that we have several people at Newmont that tested positive. Thank God we're believing that for the uh, negative test, we're believing that nothing's wrong. We believe they're going to come through with flying colors. So let's still do what we need to do. Be vigilant and do what you need to do to protect yourself. Now, you know, as I say every week, I'm still advocating for everyone to continue to get the vaccine. If you have not already gotten your vaccines, please, ma'am, please, sir, get your vaccine, get your boosters. Amen. They've even coming out with another booster, especially for the older people. They've come out with another booster. So you might want to consider getting that as well. Yes. Amen. Amen. And the monkey pox. Oh, yeah. They got this new thing out now called the monkey pox. Wow. I don't know news, but yeah. Okay. There's a lot of them, a lot of people in the country that's getting it. And I know here in Las Vegas, Nevada, right here in Clark County, they had about 10 cases. So I'm sure we had 10 cases. LA got even more than that. <laughs> So just be careful. Just be careful out there. That's yeah. That's the main thing. Just be careful. All right. Thank God. It's another Wednesday night Bible study. Amen. Now I know you have your Bibles. Amen. But I'm gonna say it anyway. Get your Bibles. Amen. Because this is Bible study, and we got a lot of scriptures to cover tonight. We are going to be talking about another yes. enemy of faith. Yes. Amen. We finished up last week with a lack of knowledge or a lack of understanding. Mm -hmm. And now we're going to a second enemy of faith. And that second enemy is called the attitude of unbelief. Yes. The attitude of unbelief. Yes. Now you notice that this takes place in your head, in your mind. You've got to have the right attitude. All right. So now. We're going to ask you to turn to the 13th chapter of Matthew. The 13th chapter of Matthew. Amen. And we're going to go all the way down to the end. But let me set the stage for you. All right? This particular chapter, this 13th chapter of Matthew, Jesus teaches a lot of parables. Okay? If you look at it, he talks about the parable of the sword. You know, the one who sold uh, on different types of ground, and we know what happened. You can, you can go back and read that, okay? And then he talked about the purpose of that parable, all right? Because he's teaching his disciples as well. And then after he got through talking about the purpose of the parable, he then further explained the parable of the sower, all right? To make sure that his disciples and everyone else fully understood then he talked about the parable of the wheat and tares. Amen. We, we know that the, the lesson was about should the gardener pull up the wheat, okay, pull up the tares uh, that was sown in the wheat where enemy came and sown it. And he said, no, leave them alone lest you damage the wheat. But at harvest time, they will be separated. Separation. Okay, there will come a separation. The wheat will go into the good and the tares will be burned. Amen. All right. Then he talked about the parable of the mustard seed. That if you just have faith, it's one of the smallest seeds there is. But after it's planted and it grows, it grows into one of the largest yeah. trees there is. Yeah. That is, he illustrated that with our faith. If your faith is just as small as a grain, it didn't even talk about the whole mustard seed. It just said if it's just as small as a grain of mustard seed, it can grow and grow and grow to be like that big tree. All right? Then he talked about the parable of the leaven. 
All right. Now, ladies, you know what leaven is. When you put that, when you put a yeast or something in bread that you're baking, it leavens it and it expands even before you start baking it. And then you bake it and it's you got this big loaf. All right. Then he talks about the prophecies and the parables. All right. And Jesus spoke about these things. Then he explained. The, the tares and what that's all about. Okay, and then if you go down further, he talked about the parable of the hidden treasure. The parable of the hidden treasure. And he again, the kingdom of heaven is comparing, he's comparing, he's, when he used parables, it was to illustrate a spiritual truth. Mm -hmm. Amen. It was it. So he used uh, physical things or earthly things to illustrate a spiritual truth. So we're talking about the hidden treasure, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that's hidden, okay? And when you find it, you find a good treasure, all right? Then he talked about the parable of the pearls of great price. Again, that's illustrating the kingdom of heaven. Then last but not least, he talked about the parable of of the dragnet. Now, fishermen understand this. Back in those days, they didn't use fishing poles like we did, like we do today. They would throw a net out there. And as they drug the net back in, it would gather up all types of fish. Now, what is the illustration there? The good fish they would keep, and the bad fish they would discard. Again, it's all about the kingdom of heaven because it's illustrating that only those who are righteous, only those who have right standing with God is going to make it to the kingdom of heaven. Amen. And everything else, the bad, the unholy, the unrighteous is going to be discarded. So all of these parables together are talking about the kingdom, coming kingdom of God. And the question is, is where will you stand? Huh. Where will you stand when final judgment comes? All right. Now that you understand that, now that we've set the stage, let's go down to verse 53. Again, one more time. I'm in Matthew chapter 13, and now we're going to start reading from verse 53. And we're talking about the attitude of unbelief, the attitude of unbelief. Starting at verse 53, it says, Now it came to pass, when Jesus had finished these parables, the ones we just said, that he departed from there. All right? So he was in Jerusalem. Now he departed. He leaves once he gets through talking about the parable. So that's self-explanatory. He leaves. He's going somewhere else. All right? Then it says, When he came or when he had come to his own country, now, his own country, we're talking about Nazareth, okay? Even though Jesus was born in Bethlehem, he is a Nazarite, all right? So when he got to his own country, he taught them in the synagogue, just like he had done other places, all right? So that they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? And coming to his own country, Nazareth, he taught in their synagogue, so they were, were amazed and bewildered and wondered and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers? Mm. So when he comes to Nazareth, he goes into the synagogue and he teaches, just like he had been doing in other places. And so now they are amazed and bewildered because remember, his family, his parents, his brothers and sisters, lived in Nazareth. And they had, he had continued there until his 30th year of age when his public ministry started. Okay? So they're familiar with him. So they, their witness says, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Where did he get this knowledge from? Let me say this. If you read the Bible and you read in Matthew, you know, the last thing before he started his public ministry, he was 12 years old. Yeah. All right. Let me kind of remember, remind you of that. 
He was 12 years old. And they had gone to Jerusalem to worship. And the family, the parents, along with some others, had left to go back home. When they discovered that Jesus wasn't with them. And they're like, bewildered. Where is Jesus? So they go back to Jerusalem. And they're searching for him. They wind up going to the synagogue. And when they get to the synagogue, they find that he is teaching He's expounding the word of God. Mm -hmm. And his parents start questioning, why didn't you tell us what you were doing? Why, why didn't you say that you weren't leaving? What, what's going on? We didn't know where you were. That's when he says, I must be about my father's business. Amen. At 12 years old. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, after that little exchange with his parents, we don't hear anything about Jesus until he's 30 years old. So for 18 years, there is no word about what Jesus did. Wow. Well, let me use my Holy Ghost imagination. We do know that his father, Joseph, his stepfather, mm -hmm. not his biological, we know that, was a carpenter. Now, a carpenter in those days did not lay vinyl, did not lay carpet. No, not like we have in our house. A carpenter in those days built houses. From the ground up, maybe out of mortar, brick, clay, whatever. But they built houses. Yeah. I'm going to say something right here. I'm going to astonish some of you people. <laughs> We've seen pitch, pictures of Jesus where he looked like he was <coughs> lily white <clears throat> with long blonde hair and never looked like he worked a day in his life. Mm. I mean, he looked milk toast white. I mean, look, he looked at his hands. They look like he never worked a day in his life. That is not the true picture of Jesus. Amen. He worked right along his father, Joseph, and his brothers. And they worked in the sun. Mm -hmm. And if you know anything about the Middle East, the heat is unbearable. Mm -hmm. This is why they always have to wear tunics or something on their head because the sun they would probably have suffered from sunstroke and maybe even sun exhaustion, heat exhaustion. So the pictures that we see is not the true picture of Jesus. And if you read in Revelations, it'll tell you his skin was like bronze, which is dark. And his hair was like lamb's wool, which is real curly. All right? Jesus worked as a carpenter. So for 18 years, he worked along his father in the trade of building houses. And we don't have any record, but I'm telling you, I'm using my spiritual imagination. I imagine that his father would let him sit around and just cross his legs and twiddle his fingers. Amen. He went to work. He went to work, and he probably has some rough hands. And he's the oldest, too. And he's the oldest, too. That's exactly right. Thank you. He was the oldest son. He's the oldest out of that family. So you know that he was working with his father, building houses just like his dad and his brothers were doing. So he didn't have no smooth, look, you know, silky looking hands. He had some rough hands dealing with that brick and mortar and that, that, you know, that clay and all that other stuff. So for 18 years, we have no record until he's 30 years old now. Amen, amen. And he starts his public ministry. So now these people are amazed and bewildered and said, where did this man get this wisdom? And these miraculous powers, how is he doing this? This is the carpet. Wait, let's go to 20, uh, 55. 54. I thought I read 54. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, 55. So they're amazed. Where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is this not the carpenter's son? Huh? Is not his mother called Mary? And his brothers, James, Jose, Simon, and Judas. Is, is this, is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And are not his brothers, James, and Joseph, and Simon, and Judas? And do not all his sisters live here among us? Where then did this man get all this? Now, these people knew him. They knew he was the carpenter's son, and they knew that he worked along with his father and his brothers. 
So the way they phrased that question, it was really an insulting question. This is just that carpenter, sir. You listen. That's how people talk. To that, that's just how they, they probably said the same thing to you. They, 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 they probably say, I remember when. Yeah. yeah, I do too. And I don't act like that anymore. Yeah, I remember when too. People will say that. I remember when you was that little snotty nose kid. Or I remember when you was that little bad, misbehaving kid. Or I remember when you was so-and-so and so-and-so. And so. Yes, you probably do. But I'm not that person anymore. Mm -hmm. I've been changed. Ooh, good God Almighty. That's it. What's that song? I've been changed. A change has come over me. Come on. I'm not that same bad. If it applies to you, I'm not saying you were. But whatever they remember you as... You're not that same person anymore. You got a new spirit. Amen. You've been regenerated. Yeah. You've been born Thank again. You. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. But see, people always want to hold that bag over you of what you used to be mm -hmm. instead of recognizing you as what you are now. And that's what they're doing with Jesus. This was an insulting question mm -hmm. to intimate that our large family was very obscure. Mm -hmm. They just knew Joseph as a carpenter. They just knew Mary as his mother and his brothers and sisters. They knew that he grew up in that area, that region in Nazareth. And so they're still looking at him from the old eyes of what he used to be. Amen. Amen. They don't see him as the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed and promised one. They don't see him that way. Isn't his Father, that carpenter? Amen. And then his mother named Mary? Who are they? They, they were nothing. They were the least in the village. We know his brothers and sisters. Who does he think he is coming to teach us? But it's amazing. It really is amazing that they knew he was doing miracles. Now, no ordinary other person in that city or that town was doing miracles. So there had to be something unique about him. There had to be something more to him than just what they thought he was as being the carpenter's son. Yeah, yeah. Okay? It just had to be. So I'm here to tell you, don't let people put you in a trick bag. Don't let people say, I remember when. Yeah, okay, yeah, you remember when, but I'm not that person anymore. And this is what they were trying to do to Jesus. They were really being insulting to him. That's exactly what they were. And I'm pretty sure some of you all can relate to that. Amen. I know I have. I've heard people tell me that. I remember when you were there. Yes, I, I was, but I'm different now. <laughs> okay, let's go on. That's, that's 55. 56 says, and his sisters, are they not all with us? Where then? Did this man get all these things? Oh, I think I read it already. 50 cents you did? Uh -huh. And do not all his sisters live here among us? Where then did this man get all of this? Who does he think he is? That's basically what they say. Yeah. Who does he think he is? We know his father, his mother, his brothers, and his sisters. They still live in that city. Remember, he had finished the parables. He went back to his hometown. Who does he think he is? Where did he get the ability to teach like this? Where did he get the ability to perform these miracles? Well, it, you, you listen, it, 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 I don't know. Maybe it's just me. But if, if, if I saw somebody and I hadn't seen them in a long time, and all of a sudden, they are performing miracles. They're healing people, whatever the ailment may be, whatever the malady may be. They're healing people. And I know that nobody else in that town was doing that. Amen. That ought to tell me something, something different about this person. Something changed, yeah. God is using this person in a different way. I, I, I don't know that they're, they're so spiritually blinded that they can't see this. So let's go further. Look what it says. We, in other words, they said, we know all about you. We know your whole family. Okay? 57 says, so they were offended at him. Whoa. 
They were offended. They were displeased. They despised him. Because you think you are that. Yeah. But he was. Yeah. And and some. And some. As you say, you think you're a bag of chips? Yeah, I'm a bag of chips and the soul. Amen. As a matter of fact, I'm the big bag. Yes, he was. Yes, he was. Because listen, he was performing miracles all around that region. And there is no way that all these miracles be taking place and they didn't know about it. It's no way. Word of mouth would have spread all over. Yeah, as a matter of fact, it did. That's why everywhere Jesus went, there was a crowd of people following him. Amen. Amen. Oh, you remember the woman with the issue of blood? Yeah. Huh? As he was walking down the road, there was so many people around him. The Bible said that he was being thronged. By so many people around him, and this woman who had the issue of blood was down on her hands and knees, crawling to get to Jesus, saying, if I could just touch the hem of his garment. I, I know I can't get close enough to him to get his attention, to get him to turn around and pay attention to me and talk to me and heal me and say, woman, be healed. I know I can't do that, but if I could just get close enough to him, to, just to grab the hem of his garment. Yeah. I just believe just touching his clothes. I ain't even got to touch him. Ooh, ooh, Close ooh. Enough. You ain't hearing me. I, I don't even have to touch him if I can just get close enough to touch his clothes. Because I believe that their power is flowing through him to his clothes out. Yeah. If I could just get and she 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 was pushing and grew and screaming and, and, and clawing her way to get to Jesus because there were so many people around him. Everything else. You know that. Yeah. It was probably telling her to kick back. Yeah. Kick back. Kick, yeah. yeah, kick it and she washed it down on the ground. But she had enough faith. Yeah. But my point is, everywhere Jesus went, there was a crowd of yeah. people yeah. around him. Because his disciples even said, because he said, Who touched me? Mm. Notice, she only touched the hem of his garment. Yeah. Not his person. The hem of his garment. And so much power, that's what that virtue means. So much power went out of him because the woman touched him in faith. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, notice what she said. If I could just but touch the hem of his garment, I know I'll be healed. Yeah. That's faith. Right there. Yeah. When she touched the hem, the hem, mm -hmm. Jesus felt that virtue, power had went out of him because. He felt it. He perceived that somebody touched me in faith. And it was unwavering faith. Woo! She was determined to get to Jesus. She was determined. I don't care what she had to do. She probably was trying to knock some people down. I know that's right. I'm going to get healed. Yeah. I'm tired of this issue yeah. of blood. Yeah. I'm going to spend all my money. It ain't yeah. no better. Yeah. I'm going to get healed. I heard yeah. that Jesus was healing people. Yeah. And I'm going to get mine. And I'm going to get mine. Except for these stupid people in Nazareth. Thank you, I know they heard it too. But they, they are offended by him. Yes. They are insulted that he has the audacity to come back here and think he's a teacher and a healer. Mm -hmm. But he was. Yes. All of that. But he was all of that. <laughs> so now they are offended. Okay, let's go on. That was 57. Okay. So they were offended. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country and in his own house. And they took offense at him. They were repelled and hindered from acknowledging his authority and caused, him, caused them to stumble. <laughs> but Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country and in his own house. Look at this. They were repelled and hindered, hindered from acknowledging his authority. Amen. Amen. His exousia, that means authority, yeah. jurisdiction, right. They would refuse, even though they had heard these things. Mm -hmm. uh, listen, even before Jesus got there, his reputation had already preceded him. Amen. 
they knew the name Jesus. They knew who he was. So this wasn't some surprise to them. And when you, you know, like any of us, now I know a lot of y'all born in the South, okay? I know every now and then you go back home. You, you know, you take that vacation and you go back to where you were born at. Every now and then he went back home to Nazareth. So it wasn't no surprise, they knew who he was, but they didn't see, they didn't fully recognize him. Now that he is in his ministry, now that the full power of the Holy Spirit is operating through him, now that he's performing these miracles and healing all manner of sickness and disease and feeding people 5,000 men and then turn around and feed 4,000 men. He's performing. And listen, we ain't talking about no big area and a whole lot of people. They knew about him. Yeah, they knew. This wasn't no surprise. But they were repelled and hindered from acknowledging his authority, and it caused them to stumble. Ain't that something? They lost out. They missed out. But Jesus said to them, a prophet, we can say a preacher today, a rabbi, whatever, a prophet is not without honor, except in his own country and his own house, among his own kinfolk. That means that everywhere else I go, they're going to recognize me. Yeah. They're going to esteem me. They're going to hold me in high regard until I come around my own people. That's right. Now, you think about that, because some of them probably treat you the same way. They better know it. They probably don't give you no honor now that you're a Christian. And if they do, they're probably calling you some name. You're a holy roller, and you all that sanctified and all that stuff. And, yeah, you don't talk like, no, yeah, I know they do it because I know I've done, they've done it to me. But I don't care because I know who I am and whose I am. Hello. Amen. Amen. So now they're offended. A prophet is not without honor. I'm coming to help my own people. I can't even help my own people. And look what the verse 28 says. We're, we're talking about the attitude of unbelief now. With the attitude of unbelief. These people got this attitude of unbelief. And so 58 says, now he did not do many mighty works there because of their, there it is, unbelief. Mm -hmm. And he did not do many works of power there because of their unbelief, their lack of faith in the divine mission of Jesus. He didn't have no power there. Mm -hmm. No, that ain't true. He had power everywhere he went. He was power. He had power everywhere he went. It wasn't because of his lack of power. It was because of their lack of believing. How many times did we read in the Bible where Jesus said to somebody, because of your faith, go in peace? Mm -hmm. he, he noticed, what did he tell the centurion? He said, the centurion came to, came to Jesus, said, will you heal my servant? Jesus says, oh, yeah, I'll go to your house. Jesus said, no, 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 no. You don't have to come to my house. Uh-uh, you, you, my house is not worthy for you to be in there. Just speak the word. Mm -hmm. Just speak the word, and my servant would be healed. Amen. Jesus says, he was marvelous. He said, I haven't seen this kind of faith even among the children of Israel. I haven't seen this kind of faith even among my own people. Amen. This is another example of it. Amen. The centurion just said, speak the word. And my servant would be healed. And he told him, go in peace, your servant be And his servant was healed that same self hour. Same self hour. Yeah. What about the woman who came to Jesus whose daughter was sick? And Jesus says, it's not me that we should give the food from the, from basically talking about the Jews. Mm -hmm. But she said, wait a minute, even the crumbs that fall from the master's table, the dogs get to eat. Amen. See, they refer to those people who are uh, low life as dogs and Gentiles. Jesus says, woo, your faith be it unto you. Go in peace. Amen. It was always seen according to their faith. These people had no faith. Because they had no faith or lack of faith in the divine mission of Jesus, he couldn't perform any miracles. It's not that he didn't have the power. 
It's the same Jesus. Yeah. And he got the power. But if you don't have the faith, it ain't going to work for you. Mm -hmm. You have got to have the faith. Mm -hmm. So he was not able to do this. And basically it was because of the way they looked at Jesus' family. Yeah. The way they still remember him as being. So that's why he said a prophet is not without honor. Except for a mount in his own country and on his own kind. His own people. And I'm telling you, that's the same way it is today. Okay, that's one scripture we go into. And we're still talking about the attitude of unbelief. I want you to go over to Hebrews now. Hebrews chapter 3. Go to Hebrews chapter 3. Okay, let me go to it myself. And we're going to start at the 7th verse. Okay, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7. Now this is talking about being faithful. Being faithful. So we're going to start reading at verse number 7. Amen. And it reads, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit saith, today, if you will hear his voice, Verse 8, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, in the day of trial in the wilderness. Amen. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as it happens in the rebellion of Israel and in their provocation and embitterment of me in the day of testing in the wilderness. Okay, now, now give me, let me give you a little history lesson in case... You don't remember. You remember that God had liberated the Israelites. Again. Again. Well, this is the Egyptian bondage. Mm -hmm. All right. This is the Egyptian bondage when they first went into a bondage from being in Egypt when Pharaoh got jealous because they were multiplying so fast. Yeah. Remember, Joseph was the prime minister. Okay. He was the only person higher than him was Pharaoh. Okay. But that Pharaoh died. And so this new Pharaoh didn't know anything about Joseph or the Israelites. And because God was blessing them and they were multiplying so rapidly, the Egyptians got afraid and said, boy, if we don't put them in bondage, they're going to overrun us. I hate to use this comparison, but it's almost like what happened with us in slavery. Yeah. Hmm. It's almost what happened with us in slavery. Because even though we were captured and brought over here to America, God blessed us and we started multiplying. Yeah. And they had to find a way to keep us okay. under subjection. Yes. yes. And that's why they did all of those evil, nasty, dastardly things to us. But the same thing applied to them. So anyway, we know through Moses that God liberated the Israelites and sent them on their way. As a matter of fact, they left Egypt rich mm -hmm. oh, yeah. with all kind of gold and silver and cattle and you name it. They wanted to get rid of them so bad, they were giving them everything they could to get out of here. No more plagues. Yeah, because of those 10 plagues. The last one was the plague of the killing of the firstborn. Yeah. All right, so now they're in the wilderness. Now, they go in the wilderness. This was a two-day journey to cross over the Red Sea. A two-day journey. Remember, Moses sent out spies, sent out 12 spies. Ten of them came back with a bad report. They too big. There's giants in the land. Lord, have mercy. What are we going to do? Sound like some okay, I'm that boy. Come on. <laughs> Sound like some of them slave Master, You what we gonna do? They about to revolt. Mm -hmm. Move on, Samuel L. Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> Django, unchained. <laughs> I happened to be watching Roots last night, so I'm sorry. But that's the way we work, and that's the way the Egyptians, uh, the uh, Israelites were. Mm -hmm. Ten of them came back with a bad report. Only Joshua and Caleb came back and said, we can take this land. God is with us. 
But of course, the 10 outnumbered the two and they believed the 10. Mm -hmm. So they wondered, this is what we're talking about, the rebellion now. Because God had promised them, I'm going to give you the land of your enemies. The Hittites and the Habites and the Perizzites and the Jebusites and the, all the Mites. Amen. He promised to give them that land. And when God makes you a promise, you can take it to the bank. Amen. But they, again, a lack of faith. The attitude of unbelief. Yeah. So they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years because of their unbelief and stubbornness and rebelliousness. Mm -hmm. 40 years. Yeah. I, I wonder why it is sometimes we don't get our blessings. Mm. Come on. Is it because we have the attitude of unbelief? Because we don't believe God. Oh, maybe, maybe because He didn't answer us right away when we wanted Him to. God, I prayed and I told you I needed this and I need it now. And because we don't get it, we think we ain't gonna get it. Is that what happened with? Zechariah and Elizabeth, they had been praying and praying and because it didn't happen when they thought it was, they gave up. Zechariah forgot who he was praying to until that angel appeared and said, God has heard your prayers and you're going to have a child and you're going to have a son and you're going to name him John. And Zechariah says, this is impossible. I'm an old man now. You should have heard my prayers when I was young and vibrant. But see, God's time is not our time. Amen. God don't operate on our timetable. He's got his own time and, and purpose and when he's going to do something. But I say this all the time. He's always on time, in time, every time, because he's above time. So when things don't happen exactly when you want it to, like with Zachariah, sometimes we give up. Amen. We throw in that towel. Mm -hmm. It ain't going to happen. Well, because they would not believe that they, God had promised them to give them that land of their enemies, they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Yeah. But to show you how God is still merciful, through those 40 years, the Bible tells us that their clothes never wore out. Their sandals never wore out. Never. It's just a miracle. They didn't wear shoes like we do. They covered their feet. They wore sandals, but their bottom of them never wore never. out for 40 years. Can you, you got a pair of sandals that you had for 40 years? I don't think so. They probably dry right if you have them. Not only that, they wondered how they were going to eat. What did he give them? Manna from heaven. Something that they never even knew anything about. And he told them how much to collect each day. Every day, just collect enough for you and your family. Don't try to collect anymore and put it up for storage or anything like that. And when those that were disobedient still did it, the manna rotted. Yeah. The only time they were supposed to collect extra was on the day before the Sabbath because they weren't supposed to do any work on the Sabbath. Amen. That was the only time they were supposed to collect extra. But you know, as some people will be, they were hard-headed, they're going to collect extra when they went to get it the next morning and it turned into worms. Amen. They weren't satisfied with the man. We want some meat. <laughs> that would have been meat. That would have been meat. That would have been us. Because I, I got to have some meat. I am, I am definitely carnivorous. I got to have some meat. Amen. I'd have said, Lord, I need some meat. I'd have, been, <laughs> I'd, have been, I'd have been praying right away. I don't want just no bread. I want some meat. Amen. Anyway, show you how good God is. All of a sudden, quail start dropping out the heavens. Amen. Isn't that something? God is something else. Huh? Start dropping quail out the sky. So they had bread and meat. They still was rebellious and not satisfied. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Still complained. But here's the thing. I would have said, well, let's double check. Let's, let's send some more spies over there. 
Let's see if we can take the land. Let's see if it's true what these other two have said. I'd have sent some more, but they didn't. But God is still able, but at the same time, he's only merciful up to a point. Because all those who would not believe anybody that was over the age of 20 mm -hmm. died off Amen. in the wilderness. He did not want those unbelieving to infect those young people. Amen. Isn't that amazing that God kept the young people around? Mm. Anybody 20 years old and, uh, and younger survived. Those anybody over that died off in the wilderness. The ones who would not believe. So what am I saying? We older people, we better watch what we say around some of these younger people because you can't influence them. Mm -hmm. Okay? Watch what you say around these younger people and watch how you live around these younger people because you may, you never know Amen. who may be watching you. You never know who you may have an influence over. I try to be very careful when I say something around my students or anybody else that I know that you because I don't know who might be looking up to me. Now, I ain't saying I'm all that, but I'm just telling you, you don't know. It may not even be your own child. Ooh, let me say that again. It may not even be your own child or even a relative in your family. It could be a total stranger, somebody looking at, somebody in your church. Some young person in your church admires you and look up to you. And just like these kids watch TV and they see these actors and actresses and athletes and they wanna be like Michael Jordan or Magic Johnson or Emmett Smith or whoever they are watching you too you don't have to be on tv you don't have to be somebody famous just the fact that they know who you are and how you carry yourself has anybody has any young person ever come up and says i admire you amen, amen. i'm telling you you don't know so be careful how you act and what you say around these young people because you could be influencing them these spies couldn't go to the promised land because God didn't want them to influence those young people and have them have the attitude of unbelief. Yes. So he let them wander in the wilderness for 40 years until they all died off. Mm. The attitude. When we talk about the rebellion, that's what it's talking about. The rebellion in the day of trial in the world. Because he tried them. Because to see if they were going to be obedient if they were going to hearken unto his voice, if they were going to listen to him. All right, let's move on. So it says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart as in the rebellion, in the day of trial in the wilderness. When you hear God knocking at your, your heart, yes, don't harden your heart. Don't be rebellious. Don't say, oh, I ain't ready. Wait till I get myself together. Because you may not ever get yourself together. Mm -hmm. You may not even get the chance to get yourself together. Oh, hello. The Bible says, come as you are. Amen. And it ain't talking about the clothes you have on. Amen. It's talking about your attitude. Yeah. It's talking about where you stand spiritually. Right. God is not waiting for you to get holy. Let him get you holy. Amen. Let him get you right. Let him put righteousness in you. Let him give you that right standing with him. You can't make yourself holy. You cannot. You just can't do it. I preached a few Sundays ago. You're in a war. You got a battle going on. Your flesh is going to try to dominate you. It should be your spirit. But that's why the Bible says, for those who are led by the spirit of God, those are the sons and daughters and children of God. Yes, yes. You are not going to get yourself together. If you could get yourself together, you would need Jesus. Yes, exactly. Ooh. You hear me? You would, Jesus would have come.
up for nothing if you can do it on your own. This is where a lot of people make the mistake. You can't do it. You have got to let the Holy Spirit operate through and in you. Come as you are is the attitude. If I don't care what you are. I don't care if you're a wino, a drug addict, a prostitute, a whoremonger. I don't care what you are, what name you want to put on yourself. Or I don't want to put on yourself. Or somebody else put on you. Or somebody else put on you. Thank you. Come as you are. See, man looks at the outside. But God looks at the heart. He knows your heart. He knows your heart. And just keep on keeping on. You know, you know, oh, I got to say this again. And I'm, this is, again, I'm going back to the mature older folk. Stop being so critical to these young people. Stop trying to put them in the same bag you were in. They are not you. We live in a different time now. So what if this young lady comes to church with a short dress on? You're going to criticize and talk about her? She ain't going to come back. Instead of you trying to take us out and teach to her, teaching her to dress modestly. Or just being hospitable. Or just being hospitable. Amen. No, they may not wear a three-piece suit, men. They may not wear a shirt and a tie. Stop judging them. Stop trying to make them fit into your little standard in your little box. Exactly. Preach. This is why we can't get young people in church. This is why we're missing the, that age group of somewhere between the 20s and the 30s of 35. Because they're tired of people criticizing them, talking about them instead of welcoming them in with open arms. Amen. We almost in the wilderness right today. Pretty much. Oh, no, it may not be trees and forests and all that stuff out there, but we still act like we're in the wilderness. Amen. So I'm trying to make them fit into your standard or to your bag. And if they don't, you unchristianize them. Amen. You're critical of them instead of helping them, praying for them. And if you don't like what they got, give them something or buy it for them. Maybe they can't afford it. I ain't saying that's the reason, but I'm saying just stop being so criticizing and criticize and listen you're turning the young people off mm -hmm. we want to reach people our, in many of our churches we are missing that age group yeah. we may have extremely young because they're coming with their parents or we have the older group but that in between group where are they yeah. we're missing them because we're being too critical of them. We want to accept them the way they are. Maybe they don't know any better. All right, let me go on. Let me go on. <clears throat> that was verse what, eight? Yeah, we go, we at verse nine. Verse nine. It says, where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works 40 years. Mm -hmm. Look, look at that. That, that goes, connects back with verse 8. Amen. Talking about the wilderness. Talking about the rebellion in the wilderness. And the, where your fathers tested me. They tested me because of their unbelief. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't believe that I was going to give them that promised land. Yeah. The land flowing with milk and honey. Now, that's not literally milk and honey. That, that means prosperity. Mm -hmm. That means goodness. Okay? That, Yes. First fruits, that means prosperity and goodness, bountiful. Yeah, yeah everything good. Everything good. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine that? that? Now, this didn't come from a man. This came from God. Mm -hmm. It was God that said, and you would think, good God Almighty, I don't know. I, I, I just really don't know. God delivered them out of 400 years of Egyptian bondage. Set them free and set, set them free rich. They had all that gold and silver and cattle and everything else. And they get to the Red Sea and to the, almost to the promised land and now they can't believe God to get them across. What more does he have to do? Wow. Okay. Your fathers tested me. Huh? Tried me and saw my works for 40 years. Saw that I failed. Gave them manna. Gave them quail. Clothes didn't wear out. 
Shoes didn't wear out. Nobody, got, as a matter of fact, let me talk about the sickness. Let me yeah. talk about that too. Let me talk about that. Come on. Even when they got sick, whatever it is, if, if you go to a doctor's office today, you go to the doctor's office today, one of the symbols in the doctor's office is you will see these two snakes crossing over, crossing over each other. You go to the doctor's office, or you can look at any medical book for that matter. That symbolizes something. You know where that came from? It came from God told Moses, if when anybody gets sick, you lift up the serpent, and if they look on that serpent, they would be healed. Mm -hmm. We still have that symbol today in the doctor's office. You see a two, it looked like a, some maybe two snakes or serpents. In, in the doctor, it, it represents healing. Yeah. Anybody who got sick got healed if they looked at that serpent. What did that take? Faith. Amen. It took faith. Those that died off did not have enough belief, enough faith to believe that looking at that serpent would heal them and they died. Mm -hmm. So we talk about healing. He said, they tried me. They tested me for 40 years. They saw my works in the, in the, for 40 years in the wilderness. They saw what I did for them and they still mm -hmm. was hard-headed and rebellious. Amen. 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 Mm -hmm. then, uh, one more verse. One more verse, verse 10. Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said, they always go astray in their hearts and they have not known my ways. Read that verse 10 again. And so I was provoked, displeased and sorely grieved with that generation and said, they always err and are led astray in their hearts and they have not perceived or recognized my ways and become progressively better and more exper experimentally and intimately acquainted with them. Because they tried him, they tested him, and because of their unbelief, they had the attitude of belief, God says, I was provoked with them. Mm -hmm. I was displeased and sorely grieved. The Bible tells us not to grieve the Holy Spirit, nor vex the Holy Spirit. Here we have the Father God, being grieved and vexed. Tell me God does not have emotions. Mm. Those are emotions. Where do you think we get ours from? In his image. Amen. We were created in his image. God has emotions. I know some people think that he's God and he does not have. He does have emotions. What does it say? He was displeased and sorely grieved. Yes. You can't be grieved if you don't have emotions. Amen. Amen. You think God don't have a sense of humor? Yes, he does. He created you, didn't he? <laughs> yeah, he got a sense of humor. God loves laughter. He created laughter. He created all emotions. We were made in his image. Yeah. That ain't just the outside. Well, it's not the outside because God don't look at so many different rainbows of the colors. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. He was deeply grieved with that generation that said, they always err. Time after time after time, and go astray in their hearts. And whatever's in your heart, the abundance of the heart is going to come out. Yes. All right? And they have not perceived and recognized my ways. They don't understand. I know my ways are not your ways as far as the east is from the west, but you ought to get some of it. All right? And become progressively. They, this is what they ought to be doing. And become progressively better and more experimentally and intimately acquainted with me. Mm -hmm. Every day we ought to be getting better. Yeah. Every day we ought to have a closer relationship with God. Mm -hmm. Every day we ought to think of when we wake up in the morning, first thing in the morning, thank God for another day. Yeah, thank, thank God you blessed me for another day. And at the end of the day, you ought to be thanking me. Thank God you carried me through the day. You let me arrive home safely. Because let me tell you something. There are some people who get up in the morning and don't make it back home. You think about the world we're living in today. I mentioned this a few weeks ago. Where is there a safe place to go? The grocery store, the movies, a concert, church. 
And it ain't just the bad people being killed. It's innocent being people killed. Children at school being killed. We ought to be thankful for thanking God when we wake up in the morning before we go to bed at night. Except for the grace of God, there go I. And you know what? My time is up for the night. We just getting started on this second part. If you want to finish, you can read some more in Hebrews. That's where we'll be back next week. I ain't finished with this. Father God, we come to you in the name That's of Jesus. Name, Father. Thank you, Jesus. We continue to thank you for our Bible study. Yes. We continue to thank you for how you illuminated, reveal your word to us, Lord, that we can grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Father, please help us not to be like yes, those rebellious yes. Israelites. Yes. Help us to see you for who you are. Help us to realize that you are God. Yes. And you're God all by yourself. You do anything but fail. There is no failure with you. And there's nothing too hard for you. Nothing, absolutely nothing's impossible with you. So help us just be patient. Yes. And wait for you to move in our lives. Because you know when, you know how, and you know where. So, Father, just help us to put our faith and our trust in you, that you know what's right for us. Yes, thank you, Father. And sometimes that might even mean saying no. Yeah. But, thank Father, we're going to even thank you for the no. Because yes, we know that you, like our Heavenly Father, you know. Your word says that if our earthly fathers know how to give good gifts unto his children, earthly, evil, uh, earthly fathers, how much more will the Father of life give good things to those that ask? Mm. Thank so, you. Father, we're just going to continue to put our trust in you, yes, continue Lord. to put our faith in you, continue to put our hope in you, because we know that you are not going to leave us or forsake us. We love you, Father. Bless your name. We give you all praise. We give you all honor. We give you all glory. Yes. And Satan, we let you know you are a defeated foe. You are a liar. You, the Bible says that you are the father of lies. And you have no authority, no power over us. So we bind you in the name of Jesus. And we command you to take your hands off of God's people. And I'm praying that if there's anyone out there under the sound of my voice that does not know the Lord Jesus Christ in the pardon of their sins, that they would come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ before it's everlasting too late. Because it's not too late until it is. So we thank you, Father. We praise you. We magnify and glorify you. Yes. We give you all praise, all honor, all glory in the body and majesty. Thank you. Name of Jesus, we pray. Thank God. Amen. And amen. 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 I am inviting you to tune in Sunday morning at 11 o'clock. Amen. As the Holy Spirit, using me, is going to preach, preach another powerful lesson. Amen. So I invite you to tune in Sunday morning to Abundant Faith Christian Ministries mm -hmm. at 11 o'clock. Amen. Amen. And for those of you that live in Las Vegas or you have family members or friends mm -hmm. that live in Las Vegas, send them to our church. Yes. We meet at the West Charleston Library at 6301 West Charleston Boulevard Sunday morning. I, I promise you that you will not be there a long time. Amen. And the word will go forth because faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of God. Amen. Amen. So you have a blessed evening and a blessed rest of your week. We will see you next week, same time, same station. Amen. And remember, we love you, Yes. but God loves you so much more. Thank you. Good night. Good night.